Turn, uh, turn to 2 Samuel 11 as we begin our study of God's Word. And this is always a good point in time for me to remind us all and for me to be reminded of the fact that studying God's Word is part of the spiritual growth process. And that process in four parts is to worship God and study His Word, to love one another, and to reach the lost. So let's always be challenging ourselves to kind of move to the next level of our spirituality and to have the whole wheel so we're not trying to drive with a flat. Last class, David, not David, Brian, talked about David uh, subduing all of his enemies. And what I would like to talk about, what we're going to study today, is we're going to talk about David and Bathsheba. This very sad story in, uh, in David's, David's life. And we'll look at one psalm related to that event. You have studied for four psalms if you read through your book, and, uh, but we're not going to be able to cover but one of those because it's so significant I really want to cover it in detail. But uh, starting here in 2 Samuel 11, let's read the first three verses. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Let's just kind of pause here for just a moment. Things are already starting to go the wrong direction here. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that I can think of for David's weakness right here. This is uncharacteristic of David. He's just, he's just been such a strong character, but here he has this great moment of, of weakness. Why do you think he was so tempted in this situation? So weak. Mary? Great point. He was out of his routine. And when you think about it, okay, the, the verse 1 points out specifically that this was the time of year when kings go out to battle. In other words, David should have been, he should have been busy. He shouldn't have been just at home. Um, but also, what has David been doing, you know, for, for really all this time up until he comes into making Jerusalem his, uh, his capital, what, what has he really been spending his, most of his time doing? Fighting? Fighting? He, was, he was doing that. He spent a lot of his time fleeing from Saul. When you're fleeing from someone and someone's pursuing your life, do you feel the need for God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even once he was made king in Hebron, king over, over Judah and not over all of Israel, he still had people who were out to get him and against him. And so there, there was this constant need for God. But here now he's, he's out of his routine, as Mary said, but he's also found uh, prosperity. And is there any danger for him right now? I mean, he's just in Jerusalem. He's not out at battle. There's no threat against him. There's no imminent outward, external um, need for him to be motivated to call on God. And that's the danger, isn't it? When things are going well, right? That we don't feel the need to call on God anymore. Why, why else is he so weak in this situation? He's all alone and bored. And that is a bad combination. That's why a lot of teenagers might get themselves into a lot of trouble sometimes, and a lot of us adults too, is uh, when you're all by yourself and you're bored, and that's, you know, de the devil uses that. And so let's just be very cautious and careful when we're in those situations to realize the Lord can really, uh, I mean, that Satan can really tempt us in those situations. Now, had David sinned up to this point that we just read in the text... I think it's very clear he, lust, he lusted after Bathsheba. Now, when he saw Bathsheba the first time, 
we can't be sure that he meant to do that. Now, some people think, well, he kind of stayed behind for a reason. And he got out at nighttime walking around on his roof for a reason. He was kind of looking for something. But that's all speculation. We don't know that. That's true. He, he might have, but we don't know. But either way, when he saw her, what should he have done? Away. Looked away. Changed the channel. You know, when you're watching TV, if you just turn the TV off, Whatever the last thing you saw was on is still on your mind. The best thing to do is to turn the channel. Well, I do think the best thing to do might be to turn the TV off. But if you could turn it to something good, get your mind on something else. I'm just using that as a metaphor. Whenever we're tempted, we don't need to just try to just do nothing because then that temptation is still going through our head. Turn your mind and your energies to something else to engage with. Um, he didn't turn away. He didn't look away. He kept looking longingly. And what did Jesus say about when you lust after a woman? What have you already done? Adultery. Committed adultery in your heart. Well, yeah, but I didn't actually commit the deed. Well, yes, but by longingly looking at that lady and wishing, I wish I could have that person, even if it's somebody on a computer screen, I mean, this is a lesson for all men. Uh, and, and women can learn, uh, of course, but men are the ones who are the most tempted, that that lust in itself is already sinful. David has already sinned in this situation. And he actually sent to inquire about this woman. Why is he inquiring about her? Yes, he had intentions to sleep with her. Now, though he had already sinned, what... Up to this point, he can't change what he already did. But what should he have done at that point? Right. He should have repented and realized what he had done and prayed to God and said, okay, my heart was not right. I see that I could have gone in a very bad path here. And, and Lord, forgive me. And, and brethren, that's what we got to do. When, when that temptation is upon you, even if you've already progressed up to a certain point, you don't have to keep going. Stop. And... Get your mind right and pray that the Lord forgives you and, and turn away from that wickedness because David has no idea how far this sin is going to take him. And there's a saying, I always get it wrong, but it's something like sin always takes you further than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to stay and costs you more than you want to pay. I got it right that time. <laughs> uh, we're going to see that in this story. And we just have to take sin so, so seriously. So as we continue, um, by the way, we're introduced to Uriah. This lady is married to Uriah the Hittite. Uh, later, the text in a different chapter tells us that Uriah was one of David's mighty men of valor. What that means is that he was one of the very men who helped David when he was fleeing from Saul. He was one of the very men who had helped to make David king. And right now, what was Uriah busy doing? He was fighting for David to try to take a city for David. And it is that man that David is, his, that, 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 that man's wife that David is interested in. So we continue here in verse 4. David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived. And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Now, apparently she was complicit in this as well, so she's guilty too. Well, now David can't hide what he's done. I mean, he, he just wanted this one night stand, apparently, and to be able to just go on about his merry way and nobody has to know. Well, now she's pregnant. And her husband's going to know she slept with somebody. So David has to figure out a way to try to cover his tracks and to try to convince Uriah that your wife is pregnant because of you, not of somebody else. So what does he begin by doing? What is his first line of defense? Yeah, tell Uriah, hey, how's the battle going? Uh, pretty good. Well, don't you want to go home? I mean, surely you just want to go home and I think that'd be good for you to do. And he even gives him a gift and, and Uriah says what? I can't go home. 
when the Ark of, of the Covenant is in a temporary shelter and, and, and when the other soldiers are out there fighting? What does this say about Uriah? He, he, he was a loyal man. He was a loyal soldier and uh, he was a godly man. That's going to be you know, a little confusing in a second when he, he gets drunk. Um, but David got him drunk. But he had to be complicit in that to some degree. But nonetheless, there, there is a degree to which this man is a man of integrity, a, a, very, a very loyal soldier. So the uh, second thing David did, as I just referred to, is he tried getting him drunk. and thought, man, if I, get, if I get him drunk, then maybe he'll go to his house and uh, then this whole thing will be covered up. But he got him drunk and still, he didn't go home, did he? So David, in, in desperation, decided, all right, I, I'm not going to be able to get him to go home. So what does he plan to do? Can you believe that, that David would actually get to the point of thinking, what I've got to do is I've got to have that person murdered. Again, it, it shows how sin takes us deeper and deeper. And all we get concerned with is defending and hiding what we've done. And uh, so he decides to, to do that, and he writes a letter to Joab, the commander of his army. And the letter says to do what? Yeah, put, put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle on the front lines and then withdraw the protection from around him so that he will get killed. And then he has the audacity, David does, to send this letter by the hand of Uriah himself. Can you imagine that? Here is Uriah carrying the letter that's going to ultimately get him killed. And he takes it to Joab and and Joab's willing, he's willing to do that. So Joab is, is also taking part in this uh, in having this man killed. And uh, Joab did as he was commanded, and Uriah was killed. He wasn't the only man who was killed, by the way. Uh, there were others who were killed, and later as the messenger explains what happened uh, as this skirmish kind of was going on, um, the, the, the Israelites kind of drove back the enemy to the wall, and then the archers shot from the wall and killed Uriah, but also killed other men. So now David is responsible not only for the death of Uriah, but for some other men. We don't know how many or who they were. And so Joab sent that messenger, go report the news of the battle to David. He said, but, you know, if David gets angry when he hears that, that men have died, tell him Uriah died. Well, Joab knew that if David heard that, that he would be happy and not angry. And so the messenger goes and didn't wait to see if David would become angry. He just told him the whole story, including the fact that Uriah the Hittite was killed. And what was David's response? Did he grieve because those men had died? and Was he sorry that he had done this and killed Uriah? No. He was glad. He had covered his tracks. Again, this shows the lunacy that sin leads us to. It can get to a point where we have no concern about how what we are doing is affecting anybody else. It's hurting so many people. In this case, literally people died and David didn't care. There were families that had to find out that day that the wife's husband was dead and that the children's father was dead, died in battle. And David didn't care about that. All he cared about was that his sin was covered. And uh, so he just told uh, the messenger, well, you just go tell Joab, you know, that's just the way war is sometimes. And uh, just don't worry about it. Just keep fighting. This is the lowest point that David has reached. He, this is not David. This is not David. And in verses 26 and 27, Now the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. 
Now, not only did he do all this wickedness, but he gets the woman that he lusted after in the first place. And life is good, except that last note of chapter 11. The thing that he did was evil in the sight of the Lord. And, you know, what we got to realize is we might be able to hide sin from other people. You might be able to hide it from your wife or your husband or your children or your boss or your shepherds or your preachers or your brethren, your co-workers. You can hide it from everybody, maybe, but you can't hide it from God. And we might think that we can always hide our sin from others, but you know in most cases what happens? It'll come back to bite you. It will get found out eventually. David was deceived. He was, de- he was self-deceived. And don't be that way. Don't be that way because you will regret it if you do. Any other thoughts or questions or comments on chapter 11 before we go into chapter 12? Brian? Yeah, it seems like Uriah had more integrity drunk than David did sober. (laughs) Good point. You know, all the things that David had just done, he was trying to get Uriah to do. Mm. To go be with the woman while people were away in battle. Right. He refused to do that even though... Even while drunk, yeah. It's remarkable. It is. It is. You, you have to have a lot of respect for Uriah and uh, grieve the fact that such a good man was put to death by someone doing such evil. Good. Any other thoughts? Ms. Debbie and, and then Phil? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. David made him drunk. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 make a good point, and and if I could go back, I I might say that a little differently. And uh, what you've said has helped me to rethink what I've said. But but I also want to challenge you in a way too to think about. Yes, David took this woman, uh, but the indication isn't that he raped her, but she slept with him too. And so what I was wanting to point out is just balance here. That yes, he sinned, but she sinned too, and. You know, I, I know the scripture doesn't point that out specifically, but I think that would be an. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. Sure. And so it would have been a fearful thing. It would have been a fearful thing. And I don't want to keep pressing my point because I, I could be wrong. And uh, we'll just let that, one, let that one go. And, you know, next time I teach this, I'll just be more careful how I say things and how I think about it. So you've helped me in making that comment. And, but, but as far as Uriah is, uh, I, again, my attitude is I just want to be balanced. I want to be fair to everybody in the text. And I think the, the Bible presents Uriah as a very um, righteous man of integrity. But then I had to think, well, he got drunk. And David can't force him to drink to drink wine to the point that he gets drunk, so he had to do that uh, himself, although David you know, made him do it. So, but again, um, I, I probably go too far on that, so thanks for pointing that out. All right, good, good thoughts. So, yes? Was there any previous mentioning of David being married or any other women in his life? Well, yeah, D- David, he had three wives that are named and others that have been unnamed. So this is another addition to his harem of women. Yeah. Phil, did you have your hand up a minute ago? Did you still want to make a point? I did. Uh, we're no different than David. David's no different than us. He, though he was a man after God's own heart, he still had the struggle with the burden of sin in his own life. Mm-hmm. 
We all have the burden of sin that we have to deal with, even after we're baptized in Christ and we deal with him. Mm -hmm. David understood that, but you're king, you have all the power, and you allowed yourself mm -hmm. to basically lock God out from this and mm -hmm. take on this, what he did, take on what he did. Sure. He could have right. He could have called his son. Sure. He didn't have to call somebody else. No. Mm -mm. But sin blinds us to God. Mm -hmm. And when God's out of the picture at that point, anything goes. Yeah. And that's what you see happening here. That's right. So one of the big lessons I think is that don't get too big for your bridge. Mm -hmm. To think that you can handle sin when it hits you. Right. It, he could have turned to God, but he didn't. Yeah, that's right. And our problem is we sin because God's out of the picture. We're yeah. doing that. Yeah. If he's in the picture, we're not going to sin. Yeah. I've never, when I sin, it's always just in the absence of God. Yeah. When I have to push it out. And that's, that's a lesson for us in the moment of temptation. If, if you'll just stop in the moment of temptation and go and pray right away, if I will do that, that's the last thing you may want to do. But that will help you to focus back on God instead of on your fleshly desires. And let Him come back into the picture. Because if He's in the picture, it'll keep you out of sin. Very good. So, Carol? That's right. Yeah, I think that's so true. It's, it's so multi-layered. Well, I'm going to move forward here into chapter 12 as we talk about David confessing his sin. So God sends a prophet to David by the name of Nathan who told David a story. And I'll just kind of summarize it. Basically, there were two men, one rich and one poor, and both of them uh, had animals. Only the poor man didn't have multiple, he just had one, a female lamb. The rich man had many flocks and herds. And the rich man had company one day and decided that he wanted to make a meal. But instead of taking from his many animals, he stole the poor man's only lamb. Now, by the way, let me say this, that, that poor man's only lamb was like a daughter to him. It ate out of his own bowl. It slept in his arms. Uh, all of us can kind of relate to what it's like to have a pet that really means something to you. I mean, it's almost just like a part of the family. And that's how this, this lamb was. And, and as Nathan is telling this part of the story, you know, David can relate because David grew up as a shepherd. He knew what it was to have an affection for, for a lamb. And so going back to the story, the rich man decided... Uh, to take that poor man's lamb and to use that lamb for the meal for his company that had come. When David heard this, he was just irate. In verse 5 and 6, David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. That's what the law required, um, not the death part. And David isn't saying, make sure he dies. David thinks this is a real person. But David was saying he needs to do what the law says and make fourfold restitution, but he deserves to die. And again, stop and think here of the lunacy that sin leads us to. David is being a total hypocrite, and he is taking this situation that is far less uh, in comparison to what he's done, and he is so ready to just stand in judgment against what that person has done. And let us be mindful of that when we have a, a log in our eye to, to remove that log and not be so quick to point out the speck in somebody else's eye. So as we continue in verse 7, Nathan then said to David, you are the man. Now that would have taken courage to say to the king. And we just need to remember when rebuke needs to happen, it's not easy, it makes you feel all nervous, sick to your stomach maybe, but if it needs to happen, we need to have the courage to say what needs to be said regardless 
of the consequences. And uh, I'm talking to myself here because that's not easy. Nathan continues saying, he says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall ne never never from your house, because you have despised me. Look at that. You have despised me. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And that's the real test of his character. He could have responded by doing anything to Nathan. He could have had Nathan put to death. But he responds with humility, confessing what he, what he had done wrong. Look at the difference between how Saul responded when Samuel confronted him about his sin. All he did was rationalize and defend what he had done. But David doesn't try to defend it at all. He knows that Nathan is right. And let us have that humility when we are rebuked. And when somebody points out our error and our sin, they're doing it because they care. To have the humility to say, you're right, I've sinned. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. It's interesting. That in Deuteronomy 22, the price that you had to pay if you slept with another man's wife is both the woman and the man should be put to death. That was the price that the law required. And so what Nathan is saying here is, you deserve death according to the law, but God has pardoned your sin. And notice he said, he has taken away your sin. Remember the definition of, of forgiveness? You shall not die. However, because by this deed you've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. One thing we learn from all this, and I'll open up for comments in a second. Jason, I know you're, you're chomping at the bits. Um, and I actually heard the other day it's champing at the bits. I don't know about that, but anyway, I, I heard that we say it wrong. But uh, one thing that we learn from this is though your sin can be forgiven, you may still have earthly consequences that have to be paid, maybe even for the rest of your life, uh, for what is basically a moment of pleasure. You may have to pay the price for that physically here on this earth. You may have to suffer the consequences of that for the rest of your days. And that's one of the lessons we learn. Because look at the four things that Nathan tells David he must suffer because of this. Number one, the sword will never depart from his house. Number two, trouble will arise from within David's own family. Then getting more specific on that, number three, his wives will be slept with openly. And then number four, his child will die. It's terrible. But God has forgiven me. Shouldn't, shouldn't God take away these consequences? I think that God has built into His, His world natural consequences that come from sin to teach us to detest sin. When we look at examples like this and we see how horrible these consequences are going to be for David for the rest of his life, it can teach us to beware lest when we sin, these same consequences happen to us. Maybe not these same ones, but... Uh, to, to remember as Romans 12 and verse 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. The baby, of course, uh, let me see, I don't I'll get ahead of myself. Okay, after this, Bathsheba gets pregnant again and gives birth to a son named what? Solomon, which means peace. But uh, God through Nathan sent a message saying to name the child what? Jedediah. Jedediah. Which means? Beloved. Beloved of God. Beloved of God. 
All right, so I'll pause at this point for any uh, thoughts or comments. Jason, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get to that. But the most important aspect of that, and we need to remember that, is when we sin, yeah, we may sin against other people here yeah. living among us, but our sin is ultimately against God. Very good. And that's the first person. We, we still may need to make peace, if possible, with the person mm-hmm. or persons we sin against here, but the priority, the first relationship yeah. we have to repair is with God. And the second thing is... is I think God had maybe go to David in a certain way because it's the same thing we see in the New Testament is why Christ taught in parables because he got people to understand and agree with the principle and then let them know mm-hmm. that he's really talking about you. Right, yeah. Um, and, and, it's brilliant. And it is brilliant. Yeah. But, but it's also a lesson to us in terms of sometimes you're not going to be able to, and I found this to be true in dealing just with people. Uh, I, I had a problem with a roommate one time, and every time I tried to yeah. talk to him, it did not go well. Yeah. So I sat down and wrote him a long letter uh, because I, I didn't allow his defense mechanism to get in the way, his embarrassment, what, whatever it was that was causing it to always go bad. Mm-hmm. And certainly, David was embarrassed by his sin. Probably sure. that's what triggered his overreaction to what he at least subconsciously recognized right. when he said, "Well, he should do what the law says, but this man deserves to die." Right. Yeah. Because he knew. But sometimes when we approach people about sin, we're going to have to recognize that there is going to be a, an embarrassment and defensiveness. Yeah. And we need to, to take an approach that allows yeah. us to get to the heart sure. of Sure. And lay down a principle first. Yeah. I think that's really good, Jason. That's, that's true. And I had not made that point. Um, and uh, we, we just need to remember that tactic because it's, it's really biblical and we see it often in Scripture. This isn't the only time we see that kind of principle. So that's really good. Uh, Gail and then Mary and then Jack. I think you also have to realize that sometimes people think they sin in a vacuum. It's just, well, I'm going to take yeah. consequences myself. But we don't realize that that can affect many other people. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We, and, and, and we tell ourselves, well, it's not hurting anybody else. Well, it does hurt other people, even if we don't realize it. it sin is so selfish. It is so self-centered. Mary? Well, just to briefly revisit the, the issue that Debbie, Debbie brought out about, uh, you know, about whose responsibility. I mean, we know David has a greater responsibility in yeah. this thing because, because he's confronted for it. Yeah. But look at the <coughs> I mean, he could have said, I'm too afraid to tell David this and mm. not say anything. Mm. And that would have been safe. Mm. And David, Well, I, I don't want to go back into that, but I, I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Jack, can you be real quick? Because i got a whole psalm to cover. It could have been 15 minutes ago, too, when I had my hand up for about seven minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jack. <laughs> but anyway, what Paul's admonition is in, in regard to fornication is flee fornication. Now, that I can think of offhand, the only time when that was done was when Joseph fled the wife of uh, what, Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, she had a hold of his clothes. She yeah. really wanted that. Yeah, and he literally fled. Yes. Yeah. And we need to flee uh, symbolically, but sometimes that might mean literally. Well, yeah, that's what I've, yeah. I've taught when I've, I've yeah. that Yeah, amen. Very good. Okay, thanks everybody for all your thoughts. Let's, uh, let's go to Psalm 51 now. And this psalm... I know that there were other psalms that you read and prepared for in class, but this, this is the one, hopefully we're going to have time to, to touch on some, that I really wanted to. We've already looked at Psalm 32 in my talk earlier. Um, this is the psalm that 
expresses David's plea for forgiveness. And you notice the title for the choir director, A Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And it's very poignant. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. And Jason made some excellent points earlier about that. You know, sure, certainly David had sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah and, and those other men who died and sinned against his own body. But in this poetic language, in a way of hyperbole, David is saying, God, you're really the only one I've sinned against. Yeah, that, that's the first and foremost uh, uh, transgression here was against the Lord. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. This is not Calvinism. This is not uh, total hereditary depravity. This is a poetic way of saying, I am just utterly sinful. Uh, in fact, in Psalm 58 and verse 3, David says, uh, even babies lie from the womb. Like, they just come out, they just come out lying. Well, no, not literally, but the idea is that's just the sinfulness of people. We turn away from God so quickly. And uh, it's poetic language. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. You purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hyssop is a shrub, and it was used in certain ceremonies, such as uh, in Leviticus 13 and 14 with the leper. And some think that David is specifically referring to uh, lepers after they have been cleansed. Uh, the, the hyssop would be uh, dipped in blood and would be sprinkled on the, the leper and he would be pronounced clean. And then he would be washed and cleansed. David doesn't mean literally purify me with hyssop. He is speaking poetically here. Verse 8, make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. There were all these things that David could not feel and could not do when he was steeped in sin. He couldn't teach transgressors God's ways, not very effectively anyway. He didn't have the joy of salvation. He didn't have a willing spirit. He didn't have God's Holy Spirit. He didn't have a steadfast spirit. His bones were broken, not literally. Again, this is poetic. He just felt crushed and devastated and paralyzed. Can we relate? All of us have been there. I've been there. And I still get there sometimes because none of us are perfect people. And we get there and we just feel lifeless. We feel empty. It's because we're not right with God. And He's saying, God, give me back the feeling of, of being one with You so I can be what You want me to be. Deliver me, verse 14, from blood guiltiness. That would be Uriah and those others. O oh God, the God of my salvation, then my tongue will joyfully sing of Your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare Your praise. We can't really praise God when we're steeped in sin. For You do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God. You will not despise. That's what we must have when we come to God because of our sin. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. I'm going to plan on Wednesday giving you the five R's of repentance from this chapter. Sometimes we just don't know how to repent. We think it's just uttering words, maybe. There's a lot involved in repentance. And this is the best place I know in Scripture to really... Uh, emphatically teach that. So we'll, we'll look at that, Lord willing, uh, in the beginning of our class on Wednesday. Oh, there they are. I don't want to put them up on the screen. Okay, just read through what you're supposed to read through in your syllabus, okay, because I don't have that written down here. So thanks, everybody, for all your thoughts and comments. Oh, oh, good grief. I'm so sorry. That's a little embarrassing.
Okay, that was just the first bell. So now we get the five R's of repentance. And maybe uh, somebody in the back can edit out that part that I just messed up. All right, the five R's of, of repentance. Well, I'm excited to have time for this now. So the first one, the first R of repentance, and this was a sermon I preached years ago, not here, another, another congregation, is we've got to recognize the sin. That's what David does here. We saw him do that as soon as Nathan pointed out what he had done. He immediately said, I have sinned. If we don't see the sin for what it is, then repentance is going to be impossible. So we've got to come to terms with what we've done and stop calling it, you know, just a mistake. You know, sometimes we might say, well, mistakes were made when talking about a situation. No, call it what it is. I sinned, not mistakes were made. I sinned. I transgressed against the Lord. So you recognize the sin. Secondly, regret the sin. It's possible that you recognize the sin and say, yeah, hey, that's sin. But you don't really regret it. You're just like, well, yeah. I mean, hey, none of us is perfect. We all sin, right? Well, it's true none of us is perfect. We all sin. But can you use that as a rationalization, as justification? I mean, people do that. I've done that before. I think we've all probably done that. So we don't need to do that. Once we recognize the sin for what it is, then we need to regret that we've done it. David said, against you, you only have I sinned and committed this great iniquity. Uh, we've, we've crushed God. And that needs to be the first and foremost thing on our mind about our sin. It's not just, well, I got caught. Or, you know, well, I, I hurt somebody's feelings. Or something like that. But I hurt God. And I regret the fact that I have done that to Him. He's been so good to me and I despised His name. Be real with yourself about what you've done. Regret it. And thirdly, relay the sin to God. It's not enough to recognize the sin and to regret what you've done and then just go on about your way. You've got to tell God about it. Well, He already knows. Well, of course He knows. But we need to confess. We need to tell Him what we've done. And if we don't do that, forgiveness is impossible. Fourthly, request remission of the sin. Don't just tell Him what you've done, but ask Him, beg Him to forgive you, to wash you and make you whiter than snow, as, as David says in this, beautiful, in this beautiful psalm. By the way, this is the only thing that some brethren might do sometimes is you just think that all I need to do is request remission of sins. And you don't think about what the sins are. You're not really regretting anything. You're not relaying anything specifically. You're saying, God, if I've sinned, forgive me of any sin. Thinking that those words alone will just make it a blank slate. It, that's not the way it works. We've got to do all of these things. And fifthly, repudiate the sin. Turn away from the sin. Uh, have the attitude that David had that he would be steadfast in heart and pray that God helps you to be steadfast and, and to have a clean heart and to serve Him in truth. So there are your five R's of repentance that I didn't have to do Wednesday. Any thoughts or uh, questions? We've got one minute. Jack? The, the sixth one is reconciliation. If you can reconcile that Good. in some way if you sold to somebody or Good. I like that. I like that. So reconciliation, of course, we don't see that in this chapter, but um, it starts with the letter R. And if we just had one more, we'd have seven R's of repentance. That would just be perfect. So think of another one for me, Jack. I like that. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Phil. When you pray to God for forgiveness, ask Him to help you love Him more and hate sin. Uh, amen. Amen. We will only love God to the degree that we hate sin and are just disgusted with it. Gail? This is just a question. Um, if you do something with good intentions in your heart, but it, is, it ends up still being a sin, does God see that as a sin because your intentions were good from the beginning? Well, there were sacrifices in the Old Testament for unintentional sins. And so I think the lesson there that God is teaching us is, yes, we can sin, unintentionally. Um, sometimes it's lack of knowledge. And that's one of the reasons we need to know God's Word better. 
And so, yes, and I think that it's appropriate to pray that, God, if I've sinned in a way that I don't know of, please forgive me of that too. And help me to know so I won't do it. But yes, ma'am, to answer your question. All right. Now, please read through page 86. Uh, yes, yeah, singing is on Wednesday. So I'm glad I had that note up there too because I'd forgotten that. So read through page 86 for next Sunday. Thanks for putting up with all my foibles.